Hello, uh, good evening, good afternoon, sorry, to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, today, as you know, uh, in, in, under the frame of the Observatory Summer School 2020, and uh, with the general uh, motto, the hospital of the future in times of COVID-19, we will address a uh, very interesting topic related with how the, at the, at the European Union level, the highly specialized healthcare providers can work together. The title of this session is European Referent Networks, High Specialized Treatment, Knowledge and Resources for Better Resources. Next one, please. Today, during the webinar, uh, just probably most of you are familiar with Zoom, but just to remind you that your micro will be muted to avoid noises during the webinar. Uh, we will uh, encourage you to, to participate and to intervene, putting questions, and you have the, the preferred way of doing that, that is through the Q&A tab. There you, you should address the question to the panelists and the attendees, and we will uh, get these questions, and uh, you will have also the opportunity to vote uh, on the interest of the question, and we will address that later in the question and answer uh, section of this meeting. If you have any kind of general comments that you would like to share with the whole audience, uh, we will ask you to use the chat functionality. Uh, just to uh, inform you that all the presentations and the recording of the meeting will be made available in the observatory webpage. And we will uh, also be grateful and encourage you to retweet uh, this uh, meeting, this, this webinar. Uh, here you have the, the, the tags you have to use. Next one, please. So coming back to the topic. Uh, the, the European Referent Networks uh, started with uh, an idea, a very basic idea, but a very powerful idea. How, uh, imagine if all the best specialists and centers from across Europe could join their efforts to tackle complex or rare medical conditions that require highly specialized healthcare and a concentration of knowledge and resources. It's a quite basic idea but quite complex to, to put in place. We have been <clears throat> attending during the last months to the challenge of putting together the expertise of the best uh, hospitals and, and, and units in Europe to tackle the COVID-19 infections. And actually the networks model, this idea of sharing the, the, the expertise and having a structure uh, has shown that uh, that's the way to go forward in order to be more efficient and to be able to share knowledge in this special situation. Next one. <clears throat> the, the, the idea of the European Referent Networks <clears throat> is uh, to uh, share the knowledge, to be able to advise and exchange expertise and clinical data on patient cases for better diagnosis and treatment through virtual remote consultations and to share the, the, the capacity of all the healthcare providers and clinicians that are members of the networks to develop research, to develop clinical practice guidelines, protocols, education and training tools, and many other actions. <clears throat> Next one, please. So far, and after the launching of the, the networks in 2017, in March 2017, we have 24 European referent networks that are addressing uh, all possible domains. Only few disease areas are still to be included under the networks. And now we have more than 300 hospitals in Europe and uh, more than 956 uh, units uh, participating in the networks. We have a strong legal basis for this. That's quite particular uh, due the, the, the subsidiarity principle that applies to healthcare in the European Union because we have the directive of patient rights on cross-border healthcare that allows us to establish 
some rules and regulations related with the networks. We have also a strong assessment process to select the, the, the centers that are really uh, fulfilling the criteria which are quite exigent in terms of technical quality and also in the general capacity of the hospitals to address complex healthcare. And we have also funding, funding coming from the European Union budget through different uh, mechanisms, grants, procurement, projects of support, etc. Next one, please. <clears throat> and we are now under the process of enlargement of the networks. We already had a designation of affiliated partners process in 2019 that includes several uh, type of centers that are not fulfilling the, all the criteria which are quite exigent, but are very good centers and with the capacity to grow. Uh, here we have uh, already over 250 units joining the networks and we launched a call in 2019 that now is under assessment where we receive uh, around 800 uh, candidatures for being members of the networks. The general idea with the European Referral Networks is to have a full coverage of the uh, members of the European Union plus the European uh, <coughs> Economic Area member states like Norway or Iceland and that all the networks areas, all the diseases are having a center in each member state. Next one please. So again, to repeat and to clarify, we have a legal base. The networks are not research projects, are not a grant, are something that is institutional and with the idea of sustainability for the future, are and should be integrated into the national healthcare systems, are not isolated uh, systems uh, that are uh, doing their, their own business. They are working for the healthcare systems and are perceived as a social value and a need by all the participants. Now we have a strong political support and a feeling of ownership of all the uh, different stakeholders, patient, patient association, professionals, hospital managers, uh, national authorities, etc. Next one, please. Now, where we are, we have the 24 networks. We are having an uh, increasing number of patient case cases discussed virtually, and for that we have a, spe a special devoted virtual uh, clinical patient management tool. And uh, we have already uh, covered around 1.5 million uh, rare disease patients through the members of the networks. The networks are having a consolidated governance structure that it's around a coordinating center with a coordinator and with a number of members that can, can be different depending on the network. We are having networks with less centers to their specificities with around 20 centers, two networks with more than 70 members. Currently. And they are developing all of them, training, education, and awareness actions. A huge amount of clinical guidelines and protocols are developed or under development. And there are <clears throat> ongoing research projects like registries, patient registries for all the networks, and other elements that are uh, after only three years showing that the network will have a huge impact in the <clears throat> care and in the uh, evidence related with the rare diseases in the European Union. Next one, please. And now coming back to the agenda, today we have the, 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 the pleasure to have two main uh, speakers that are representing probably the two fundamental uh, domains of the network implementation the hospital managers and the clinicians. Both of them are key uh, actors in the implementation of the networks. And uh, we would like to have them explaining us what are their vision on the networks, which are the challenges that the networks are <coughs> uh, uh, showing to the managers and to the uh, professionals and 
how they envisage also the future related with the networks. After these two presentations from Ernst Kuipers, the CEO of the Erasmus uh, Medical Center in Rotterdam, Netherlands, and from Ruben Diaz Naderi, who is the Deputy CEO of International Affairs and Clinician Pediatrician in the Hospital San Juan de Deu in Barcelona, Spain. We will have a, a session of question and answer, and we will have, uh, we, we encourage you again, I encourage you again to put your questions because this is the most important part of the today's seminar. Your questions and the debate, we will have that after that. And uh, now we will start directly with uh, Ernst Kuipers. Uh, Ernst Kuipers is a key actor in the development uh, of the back, please. <laughs> in the development of the networks, the Erasmus Medical Center is one of the protagonists of the European Refer Network System. He also was the host. Uh, of the first meeting of uh, hospital managers that we had in 2017. And when we started to create the community of hospital managers uh, related with the European Refer Networks. They, he has a very strong view on the networks and a huge experience. And uh, I just uh, would like to ask you, Ernst, to, to take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Enrique. It's my pleasure. Uh, let me first share my screen with you. Because I do indeed believe that the European reference networks are a major step forward in taking care of patients, uh, both in diagnosis and in treatment and the further management of patients with rare diseases. And as, as, I, as you are all aware, this is not a small group. Um, when discussing that, I usually like to go, let me see how, um, like to go and first briefly take a step back, in fact even take a step back about 600 years. This is two pictures from the beautiful hospital Saint Louis in Paris, now part of the large uh, uh, AP, uh, HP uh, network. And this was built in the 1400s as a hospital in the outskirts of Paris at that time for something which we are now also very common with, and that was management of an infectious disease, actually in that time, the plague. Now for hundreds of years thereafter, um, hospitals were not things that we commonly look at now with nurses and doctors where you go for a diagnosis and for a treatment, but hospitals mainly were places to be nursed. So you only went there when you had no social network um, or when you were expelled from your own, or for instance, because you were considered to have a contagious disease. This only changed about a hundred years ago for three major reasons all around the turn of the century. First was the development of anesthesiology. The second was the recognition of the source of many infectious diseases. And the third, as depicted here on this slide, was the occurrence and the development of radio diagnostics. What you see on this slide is actually the first pictures being taken, the, the oldest pictures in the archives of uh, Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, only a few years, taken a few years after the first description of uh, radio, uh, radiologic uh, uh, x-rays by Madame Curie. So these were three major game changes just about 120 years ago. And also about 100 years ago, they experienced uh, a very similar situation to what we have now with COVID. And this is just some similar pictures, very similar to the situation which we have now, how to avoid, in that case, Spanish influenza in 1980. And you see that they had other solutions also for keeping a five or six foot distance. Um, things then first slowly and later rapidly changed. This is uh, one slide which shows the main results of one of the many publications of the beautiful Global Burden of Disease Study, published now five years ago in The Lancet. Um, and it reported that over a period of a small 25 years, our global life expectancy had increased with 6.3 years. 
in less than 25 years. And you see the world average on top, 6.3. And then uh, in the right panel, you see the differences for individual uh, continents. Uh, but if we focus on Europe, it was again five years in less than 12, 25 years increase. And you see uh, the major improvement, uh, for instance, in uh, orange or red improvement in outcome of cardiovascular disease, in dark blue infectious disease, uh, in yellow cancer, etc. Uh, these were major improvements, but most of them were made in common conditions. Myocardial infarction, the most common cancers, etc. Um, and as such, you may on one hand say that life is looking beautiful, uh, like this picture here, but there are also many dark clouds. And one of that is that with all our new knowledge and intervention possibilities, etc., the actual day-to-day -day work for our workforce, whether it's nurses or physicians or support staff, etc., is changing very, very rapidly. I usually like to compare it with somebody who goes to conservatory to study classical piano, the grand piano, but then during the further career has to switch to the bass and then has to switch to the violin or the trumpet and first starts with classical music, but at some point may have to change to jazz or even the blues. It may sound like a strange comparison, but just think of people from my generation when they trained in surgery, they were first trained in open surgery, then in laparoscopic surgery, uh, and that only continues with robotic surgery. So it comes as no surprise that at the entrance of our hospitals nowadays, it's not just signs referring to one or two medical specialties, but it's usually signs like this going to all sorts of different types of medical specialists, and this only expands further and further. And that also explains that uh, healthcare, in particular hospital healthcare, is still very labor intense. At the moment, for instance, in the Netherlands, but also in Western Europe, about one in seven people with a job has a job in healthcare. And if we expand at this rate, we will in 20 years from now see that one in four has a job in healthcare. And that led Mark Britnell from KPMG last year to publish his book on the healthcare workforce. At the same time, our say clients, our patients expect that um, healthcare is delivered close to home, almost like small scale, but that they receive the the quality and the continuity, etc., of a large national or even international operating uh, brand. So all of this really asks for collaboration, for joining forces and for simultaneous working together. Um, and as mentioned, we should do even more so for patients with rare disease, but because most of the new developments that we've seen over the past 25 years really benefited patients with common disorders, and I mentioned some, but much less so patients with rare diseases. And I usually like to explain to people when I talk about this, and all the participants here in the meeting are well aware, but when I talk about this, that even though we speak about a rare disease, there are many, many different rare diseases, and in total, they are estimated to affect approximately 30 million patients in the European Union, a huge number. So whereas individual rare diseases are rare, rare diseases as an entity are not rare at all. Um, and many of these cases actually are now also trying to seek their way uh, across borders. This is, as you can see again, a similar picture, rare is not rare. And patients know this, this is, um, uh, something uh, partly in English and partly in Dutch, but it's just one example of a newborn child here in the Netherlands who was repeatedly in the news over the last few months because he was born with a rare congenital progressive muscular disorder um, with a very poor prognosis, but now with the possibility of a gene therapy at a huge cost for which his parents with fundraising uh, were able to get together almost just over 2 million euro 
to receive treatment elsewhere in Europe. So European reference networks have brought us major new collaboration and hopefully will also bring, and I'm very confident that will bring us new perspectives for patients with rare diseases like the patient that I just showed on the previous slide. And yet when doing that, we also have several major challenges. Uh, we need, and I've just depicted a few on this slide, um, we need to be much more aware and really advocate that centers of expertise on specific diseases that are not yet incorporated within an ERM should do so. And they should do so from all across Europe. Uh, we should also make sure that there is sufficient funding for sustainable growth and development of the ERNs. And to the right part, I mentioned that even though we have certain areas which seem to be covered in rare diseases like congenital heart disease, they are not all included. Not all congenital heart diseases are included in the ERN heart. So the ERNs should be more comprehensive and covering the full spectrum of rare diseases related to that organ. Um, and finally, there are a number of rare diseases which so far do not fit into one of the existing 24 existing uh, ERNs. So we have to think, and luckily we, uh, there has just been a proposal and a movement to add three further ERNs. And I think that this is a very smart and excellent proposal. So coming together, um, we as European hospitals and as European healthcare providers, physicians, but also researchers, etc., have a lot to offer to our patients. But we also expect it to offer a lot, not only to patients with common diseases, but also to those many patients with a rare condition. And we can ideally do so in a much better way if we strengthen this collaboration across Europe. Together, we have a significant and huge population and we can benefit by um, having pay, making sure that patients have access to further knowledge but can be included in trials etc so yes i'm a strong supporter of the ERMs, a strong believer and i've already mentioned the challenges for the coming years and with that i go back to you enrique thank you very much thank you ernst thank you very much as I explained before, Ernst has been a really key actor in, 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 in this process and, and is one of our heroes related with the networks because, uh, as he explained, the, 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 <clears throat> the environment is changing so fast and we the need to, to exchange this knowledge in a, in a quick and efficient way that uh, we need to, to to sustain and to support the networks, to expand the networks, as he mentioned. Now, this is a process we have to address in the upcoming two years, but we can talk after that later in the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Ernst. Then let me turn now to Ruben Diaz. Uh, Ruben is also uh, one of the key actors in the, in the networks uh, <clears throat> implementation. He has been involved uh, in, the, in the Hospital San Jan de Deu in Barcelona, which is a pediatric hospital, in the implementation of the networks in a, in a very important way, as they have been supporting, as was the case of, of Ernst in, in Rotterdam, that the clinicians, the different specialties in the, in the hospitals with the, that are already dealing with uh, a lot of complex and rare diseases were able to uh, join the networks during this process of a call for membership in 2016 and now again in 2019. So uh, <clears throat> Ruben, please, uh, I would like to give you the floor to see from the perspective of a clinician or a, a manager related directly with the clinician work, how do you see the networks for your hospitals and in general for the healthcare system? Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, the observatory, for, for having me here. And uh, let me just also share my screen if I can. Well, let me, uh, let me uh, as Enrique said, I am uh, uh, a clinician 
who have been now very much been involved in, uh, in a little bit of managing and the uh, networking the, of my hospital here in Barcelona, Spain. And I'm going to try to give you a little uh, a, a view, a view, a close a view of a clinician as he's approach, he or she is approaching, you know, this uh, challenge that represents caring for rare disease patients. Um, this has been alluded to. Let me give you a little bit a, a better, a, a bigger sense as to uh, what are we talking about in terms of uh, uh, patients afflicted with rare diseases. When we look worldwide, would be roughly a 400 million of which, and I think that's what brings relevance to a hospital like ours, which is a children's hospital, 70 to 80% are children. You know, and 80% um, of those are extremely ultra rare. 60% of them are seriously ear and disabling. So this is not a small population when you put them all together. And 50% require some sort of long-term therapy. 80% or so have a genetic cause, thus the presence of children, you know, as the uh, prominent presentation, you know, of rare diseases is in children. And there, although there's been a, a significant development in terms of pharmacological therapy, we're a long ways out, you know, sort of things. Only 5% of the rare diseases have an approved treatment of, of some sort. Now, there are distinct challenges in treating rare diseases. I think these are shared essentially by clinicians and, and wherever they work, uh, mostly in this case in a hospital. Obviously, there is, uh, with time, there's an increased complexity in these treatments and, and not, not all the time these are very easily accessible. You just heard Ernst talking about uh, uh, genetic therapy worth uh, 2 million uh, euros to sort of get an approach. So there, there is a clear need for an interdisciplinary approach because some of these patients also require very sophisticated surgery, depending on what kind of rare disease they have. And clearly there's training uh, associated with uh, the capacity to, to treat these patients. We also need uh, techno new technologies for, to, to be able to advance. We mentioned a little bit about drug development, uh, potentially diagnostics, and now potentially e-health because uh, not these patients often are not necessarily close to a major medical center to be treated. We, and I think that applies in general to healthcare, but we also probably need uh, different ways to deliver, you know, the, the, the healthcare and potentially there's need for networking, something that we were talking about today. But also I think if you look more broadly, you need uh, new professional roles to be able to support some of the uh, processes that we are trying to support. Now, in terms of resources, obviously, human resources and the economic needs are here. We mentioned about the complexity of treatments, so that those are uh, quite challenging uh, in some settings. And then there's the issue of equity. You know, these, these presentations we talked about, the rare diseases as a whole are, uh, have a big impact, but each condition can be very so rare that barely uh, any attention can be given in a particular area. So there has to be equity between these conditions and there has to be equity between these clinical units. So when we look closer again to the, to the clinician's work, I think that what we see here is that there are distinct challenges there too. I mean, we talk about the knowledge of the disease. This is not necessarily all that clear sometimes, but not everybody has distinct knowledge about a particular illness or a particular condition that may be only present in five, six, seven, eight patients in a whole country. And, um, and not only that, but even if you were to know about the disease, often enough, you, don't, you may not even have the experience in the practice in order to be able to even treat these patients. So this creates a, a, a huge challenge for, many, for clinicians. And, and to some extent also, the, it's very much dependent on our capacity to, to have a multidisciplinary approach to, to, sort of, to these patients, because often enough, it's not just the one person who knows about this case, but uh, you may need other uh, physicians who have never seen this case to be able to address some of the problems associated with a particular rare disease. And of course, access to treatments. You know, uh, being so rare, even if the treatment is somewhat identified, often is not so easily accessible because the, so they're, they're so, they're so scarce, sparse, uh, sparsely treated uh, patients out there. So overall, I think what the future is giving us, I think there's a couple of issues that I, we wanted, I wanted to share with you. One is obviously the effort that a lot of hospitals are doing to start coordinating the clinical care within each hospital of these rare disease patients. And I think this is an area that probably needs development. And 
in, a more fitting for this discussion today is the uh, need, as you could see, you know, uh, to network as a, almost as a requisite, as a requirement to be able to advance in this in the area of rare disease care. And thus, the creation of the European Reference Network, so well alluded by uh, both Enrique and Ernst, I think is a great step forward. Because if you look at these other definitions as to what these networks are about, you know, the main objective is to bring together the best specialists in the diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up into a single network, which allows to provide the best treatment for patients, regardless of their geographic location. And I think this is perhaps indicative is not just a network of physicians talking about a rare disease, but it's a network of physicians that has to actually, physicians or clinicians, because they're more, uh, there's a number, there's a multidisciplinary kind of work, that they're in, that they have to sort of take steps to care, to really care for these patients at some level or another. You know, when we talk about, you know, these diseases, obviously, you know, we, we could think, you know, as a clinician myself, we've been sharing a lot of information, especially when there, there are cases that are so rare in a setting of a medical association or, or a research group where we share knowledge, where we even try to establish clinical guidelines. And indeed, we've, we, uh, we press ourselves to sort of provide training or uh, physicians or young physicians who can sort of train in these sort of very clear specialties. But with this network, I think we're trying to go a little bit beyond that. You know, we want to we wanna allow to we provide the capacity of, of these reference networks to start conceiving how to share data in, in, a, in a functional and useful way, how to structure themselves in such a way to give each other uh, members of this network clinical advice. Uh, that responds to the needs of specific patients out there. How to sort of explore uh, the current therapeutics or advance in the creation of no new therapies and new treatment uh, approaches to some of these diseases. And of course, maintain a clear, clear uh, focus on research and improvement of the care of these children or children or adults, sorry, uh, my bias as a pediatrician. Um, by expanding this capacity, I think the clinician now also depends on additional stakeholders to be able to do its work. One, and clearly uh, an a very important one, are patients themselves. I think it's thanks to patients, associations, and organizations that in, in some ways also the reference networks have sort of come, uh, come about. But I think these are key players to sort of support these networks, but also support the clinicians trying to advance in this area. Obviously, we need not only clinicians that are, expert, that are experts in those disease entities, but we need uh, a number of other uh, members of a multidisciplinary team to support that. And obviously, it's been brought up, uh, a lot of the work that's been done in the setting of, a, of this set of network requires hospital management to support it because a lot of the, uh, the operating uh, actions are really embedded in hospital care. And obviously, from the point of view of already being described, both the public health services, the member states, and in this case, in the, in the case of the ERNs, the EU, EU Commission play a distinct role in supporting this sort of activity. I bring this up because I think it's, a, it's one of the uh, relevant uh, issues in, in, in these reference networks is to sort of start having a clear strategy to share data. Remember that I mentioned that probably any given center for some of these rare diseases will only see a few patients. So it's critical for, to be able to advance in the treatment, in the understanding and treatment of these patients to sort of share the information that is being collected across many different uh, medical centers. And in order to do so, one of the first steps that the ERNs are taking is to establish clear registries for each of the ERNs so that we can actually start collecting uh, data in regards to how many patients we all have. You will be surprised to know, and I think I, I, Ernst can respond to that in his at Erasmus, but I can certainly speak for ourselves here at San Juan de Deo. There are very few hospitals that actually know how many rare disease patients they treat, because not, not all of them are really registered as such. And I think this is a key issue that I think it's, very, uh, it's a great step to take in order for us to be able to advance. The other one, obviously, there's data associated with patient management, and more importantly, as we advance, and I think this is something that we need to sort of uh, address very, uh, very soon, is how do we start structuring 
the outcomes that we're getting as we are you know, treating these patients with different uh, treatment modalities as such. Now, we also have to be aware as we look forward that the data sources are actually expanding. You know, the, the patients themselves are collecting data. Uh, patient organizations are actually even uh, registering themselves. They have their own registries and are able, are able to even register data that I think we need to sort of address and how to integrate into some of our uh, uh, databases. Now there's a whole expanding uh, area of wearables that create a lot of information that can be very useful for some of these rare disease patients. So we need to sort of learn how to integrate that information into, into our databases and obviously all the clinical care that we're doing. In terms of data analytics, though, one of the key issues here, and, uh, and it starts with the registry itself, is how do we standardize that data? Because that is, and, and in, in many ways, I think hospital coding, for example, it does not fit very well with the needs of, uh, of rare disease patients because they're very coarse in their capacity to sort of uh, assign a code to a particular disease entity. You know, there's been an initiative in Europe, as Orphanet, which has been uh, elaborating a very structured approach to sort of uh, codif codify rare diseases. And this is, a, I think, an initiative that uh, most uh, healthcare systems have to sort of address if they want to sort of uh, standardize a little bit the approach as, as to how to treat a rare disease patients is to incorporate some sort of a codification that can be harmonized with other systems in the, in, as a way to sort of follow these patients. As we, as we start collecting data, we will be able to start doing some benchmarking, you know, as, uh, because we will be able to finally collect information from a sufficient enough number of these patients to start actually doing some comparison in terms of what are the efficacy of our of our actions for these patients are. And, and clearly the application of uh, artificial intelligence could become very useful as we advance in this area because uh, in order to sort of potentially learn to even personalize therapies in some instances. Now for this kind of approach, we need resources and among them, uh, analysts uh, are going to become an issue for us as, as with any other, uh, other areas in healthcare too. And obviously we need a, a bit of a digital infrastructure uh, to sort of accommodate for that effort. And not least, uh, we should be concerned about privacy issues. You know, so the general uh, digital uh, guidelines and uh, regulation guidelines uh, in terms of patient information have to be sort of uh, addressed very clearly because not uh, those can be, con uh, con uh, there could be concerns as to how we share this data and for what use you know, we do so. Now in terms of clinical practice, I think that one of the steps that the ERN has taken and, and I think uh, out of the, you know, if any of the lessons that we've learned with the, pan uh, with the COVID pandemic is that we have been able to sort of accommodate e-health work very rapidly but, uh, but one of the issues that, uh, that has helped and one of the broad-based initiatives uh, for the ERNs has been the creation of, a, uh, of an online tool to sort of share patient information between uh, clinicians in, in, um, in specific ERNs. Uh, it's called the CPMS, the Clinical Patient Management System, where uh, patients are evaluated locally and the information when, when needed is loaded into a system that others can sort of provide a consultation or opinion and guidance in terms of what to do with these, with, some of, with these patients that are in need of sort of support. But I think going beyond that, and I think also Enrique alluded to that, and I sort of brought this up, there has to be an effort also to sort of restructure our, our multidisciplinary teams to sort of respond to this. And I think that also clinicians have to sort of break their clinical silos and open up a little bit. It's not sufficient just to have um, uh, the capacity to share. We have to have the ability to do so even within the, our own institutions, because this is how we're gonna potentially be able to define patient journeys in such a way that we, we can really support uh, the care for these patients. And this is a, you can see, this is a little bit of a diagram to sort of address the concept of how if we apply multidisciplinary approach to this and bring together, even within an institution, the different stakeholders, uh, clinical stakeholders that can sort of uh, support the care of these patients, 
we can take it from knowledge to, to, to true wisdom, you know, to sort of learn from the realities that each, uh, each unit is looking at and create a, a stronger and more solid uh, approach to these patients altogether. In terms of therapeutics, I think that obviously the, uh, the, the approach to sort of share uh, the patient information can help identify therapeutic uh, uh, treatments that could, be, uh, that could be targeted to specific patients and that can be shared uh, between, uh, between professionals and the ERNs. But the concept, we, we will, I think we will have to address in the near future, the concept of how do we uh, uh, provide access to very advanced therapies, uh, as was just alluded uh, to, uh, by Ernst, for example, gene replacement therapy, gene therapy. You know, th these kind of therapies are very expensive and potentially uh, there shouldn't be that many centers across Europe that, uh, to, to have the, we don't, we would not need so many centers in Europe to do, uh, to, to fulfill the needs uh, for our patient population in Europe. So the question is, how do we uh, establish treatment hubs? Uh, and if we do so, uh, do we then uh, allow for cross-border uh, to have patients as opposed to clinicians sharing for patient information Will we, be, will, will we be in a position to, to allow patients to, cross, uh, to get cross-border help? And, and how would we, we be supporting that at the uh, member state level and at the uh, European level? I think these are the sort of things that we probably have to start uh, uh, tackling soon because this, uh, as these treatments uh, become more established and, uh, and, and consolidated in some of the centers that we have around Europe. Finally, obviously, the, the ERNs provide the uh, 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 fertile ground for, uh, for broad-based clinical trials. And I think this, hopefully, with the registries advancing, uh, that we will have access to, to the volume of patients that would make these clinical trials worth doing altogether. So just to finish, because I think the, uh, the idea here is to really open this up to a question and answer. I think this, this image has already been shared in some form or fashion. I think the ERNs is just a layer that covers Europe, but they have to cover each center that belongs to the ERN has to, to some extent, also provide coverage in the regional area that where it works, because uh, not necessarily, you know, not necessarily all patients have clear access to these uh, ERN centers. And that I think there has to be, uh, the, we have to conceive regional networks that support, that are supported by the, uh, by the knowledge and the, uh, and the, and the evidence that is, uh, that is uh, evaluated at the ERNs, but this regional network should be able to also uh, be there to support this uh, patient care. So I leave it at that and open it up to discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruben. That was uh, really very, very clarifying of, of what the networks are now uh, meaning for the clinicians and, and how the networks are also addressing elements of the discussion of the of the what the clinician wants to do no? and, and how that can be uh, uh, enlarged at the European level in a way that we are having mo much more efficient way of solving the, the challenges especially for for these rare diseases uh, that you have been uh, explaining no? the, the, the complexity and at the same time the diversity of the of the diseases and the, the, the the complexity to have experts in all member states, in all, all hospitals, in all the diseases. So that it's clear that the added value of the networks in terms of economy of scale uh, will, will help the, the, all the stakeholders, all the actors in this, in this uh, <clears throat> area. The clinicians, the patients, the health authorities, uh, the experts, as they will learn from each other. And I will say, that, and you have presented that clearly in your, in your presentation, multidisciplinarity and learning from the others is a, a key element of the networks. So uh, now uh, we will have uh, until uh, 5.30 time for discussion, for question and answer. We got already uh, several questions. Uh, Anna Diaz and Katia Urbanski are uh, behind the scenes, collecting all your questions and putting, you, you can see here, some of the questions that are already uh, posted by you. 
And uh, if you allow me, Ruben and <clears throat> Ernst, I will, I will just address the different question to you. Uh, but feel free to discuss or to intervene because you will complement each other very good. So if we, if we, we can start from, with the first question from Adana Chubuma. Uh, she's asking if we can describe in detail the specific activities that the networks are involving, and secondly, uh, the, the, the focus on the networks. No, that she is saying that uh, apparently uh, the networks are focusing on rare diseases, and if there are the opportunities to explore more common diseases. So, if you allow me, just to uh, formally speaking. Uh, uh, the specific activities of the networks are very well established in the actually in the legislation are in the in the in the technical characteristic of the networks. I invite you to visit the, the web page of the Open Referral Networks. You have received this link, and there you will find all the information. But I think that uh, <clears throat> Ruben and Ernst uh, already addressed the different activities that related with the, with the networks. And uh, the second question on explore more common diseases. We have been discussing that several times with many actors, probably Ernst and, and Ruben here, you, you can add uh, your, your ideas here. I would like to say that uh, uh, in general, the idea of networking, it's a great idea for all type of diseases, but the specificity of the rare diseases is the need of sharing knowledge in complex areas where the expertise is scarce and the, the, the patients are, uh, are rare. So, and then uh, th th that means that even big member states, big hospitals are not having the capacity to have all the knowledge in more common diseases like could be, for example, diabetes, not rare diabetes types, but general diabetes, the, the added value of a, a structure like the European Repair Network is not so clear. Of course, it's clear the, 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 the value of networking, of a change in knowledge, but uh, we have to see very carefully if uh, such a huge structure as the European Repair Networks are, will be needed for more common diseases. What your what your uh, thoughts uh, on this, uh, Ruben and Ernst? Well, I can, I, I think networking it's a good, it's a good tool for about every disease entity that there is, you know, sort of thing. I think you know if if the, I think, but I do think, as you said yourself, that for rare diseases is a complete necessity because you just don't have access to these patients all, you know, in your, in, even in a regional setting, even in a country setting sometimes. So it's critical that people network. But look at what's happened with the COVID pandemic. Um, this, is not, this is no longer a rare disease, but the ability to network and to learn from the experience of, you know, in one area, in one place to another is so useful. So I think that what we're learning with the ERNs uh, as we advance in this area could certainly, in my opinion, be applicable uh, to other disease entities that maybe are not, you know, as rare, just because of the how to structure, you know, a, a network and how to work in the structure. So in my, from my point of view, this is an area that for fertile growth in the future, you know, uh, for, for areas other than rare diseases. Yeah, and Enrique, if I can add to that, I think that we all realize that networking in current clinical practice is crucial. It's essential to, provide optimal diagnosis and treatment to patients, but also to bring it forward, collaborate and research. But this is networking on many different levels. Uh, it starts with networking within your own institute. It's, uh, strange enough, but many of the conditions and the patients that we treat actually ask for a whole team, not just one nurse or one physician, but people with many different specialties. So it's networking within your own institute the networking as Ruben also referred to in a region on a national level, but also on an international level. I think the, the, the crucial concept behind the ERNs was the recognition also within the EU that we have such a large population, but that for patients with rare conditions, we really need that large, uh, that large population and the expertise which is present uh, all across Europe and even for many patients also outside. Uh, that also, and it adds one important aspect, it 
provides reassurance to patients that wherever they are in which European country they live, when they have or that child or has a rare disease, that via the ERNs within their own country, within their own city, they may have access to the best knowledge that is there. And Ruben also very nicely showed that in the beginning of his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Ruben. And, and so we can go to the next question. It's coming from Sasa Tesseretelli. Uh, and she's asking about what, which kind of connection has uh, the, the open reference network system with the WHO. Uh, probably just as a general remark, uh, just to differentiate that the European Referral Networks uh, are under the frame, the scope of the European Union, so which has a, a specific legal uh, environment and relation environment. We have very good relation with the WHO. Uh, in Digisante, actually the Observatory of Healthcare System of the WHO, uh, organizer of this uh, <clears throat> uh, summer school, is working closely with us in the in the networks area. Is preparing with with uh, with us and is preparing a study, for example, of the uh, cost uh, elements of the networks that is discussed uh, currently and will be discussed with the hospital managers. And of course, we are open to discuss any other common areas of interest with the WHO. Uh, yeah, Enrique, if I, if, I can, if I can add to that, because we had a, we had a, a for good reasons, uh, both Ruben and I referred to congenital rare conditions, but we might also mention that there is a whole range of rare oncology, uh, oncological conditions, and that also in that respect, for instance, there's very close collaboration with the WHO, and in particular with uh, IARC. Yeah the International Agency for Research on Cancer, for those who are not aware of it, but which is a WHO uh, agency. No, exactly. There are many, I mean, there are many links, of course, in the, in the everyday life, even at central level, clinician level, institution level. Uh, we had also in the past some some connections with with the WHO because they were interested also in the in the highly specialized networking model. So to see if that could be uh, exportable to other areas of the world. So it's something that we are of course open to discuss and to see because I think that the, the idea of the networks is now uh, in development. We are learning, each of us, from, from the experience of the networks. Probably we are trying to go too quick sometimes. I have this impression. We are asking too much. You are asking, we are asking too much the managers, the clinicians, to everyone to have outcomes, to have a resource, which is OK. It's very good. But yeah. also we, we, we need some, pa some patient to, to develop uh, the, the, the system and to have the maturity, and I am sure as was mentioned also by, by Ruben, no? and the COVID-19 uh, example is very clear, that we will need to, to use this, this, uh, this uh, lesson learned to, to apply that uh, in other areas. The COVID, the, the developing a new network on rare and complex uh, and threatening infectious diseases is one of the ideas we are addressing now. We want to discuss that with the member states and with all the players, and probably it's the next thing we are having in our agenda for the next months as well. Uh, and Enrique, can I add one thing in addition? Because uh, yes, of course. Ruben challenged me by saying, do you know how many rare patients your hospital treats every year? And the, and the honest answer is no, I don't. Uh, but what I do know is that over the years, and I see that in the Netherlands, but, but I visit many other European countries often, and I, I know that the same is happening in Spain and in many other places, is that patients with rare diseases more and more are being concentrated or have a connection with larger hospitals, so that those larger hospitals um, see more and more patients with rare diseases, either on and off or continuously. So I don't know the actual number for Erasmus at the moment, but I do know that it has strongly increased over the years and is further increasing. Uh, so the, add... the fact that those hospitals have a link with the ERNs is very, very important. 
No, I think, uh, you know, just you brought up a very important issue is that uh, as, as, care is, as care for these patients is becoming more complex, these patients concentrate in, in these large tertiary care centers. When we, and, and I mentioned pediatrics mostly because of the, obviously where I sure. come from, but when we've yeah. done that study, when we've tried to look at, at the patients that we have identified as rare disease patients in our mix, and, uh, and perhaps in terms of our volume, because we also provide general care, general you know, uh, pediatric care for, the, for our region, that, uh, that amounts to about eight or 9% of our patient population that we have identified has rare disease patients. But believe it or not, these patients take up 30 to 40% of our budget. You know, just to give you a sense as to how, what is the impact of rare diseases in our these big medical centers? And I'm sure that in your setting, if you and you know you analyze, maybe the numbers may differ a little bit or not. But uh, but this is a it's a big concern for hospitals, you know, and, and and how to structure that. And that's why I was prom we are promoting a little bit the concept that it makes sense for hospitals to create or to coordinate somehow the care for these patients, so that you know they're you know they're they're somehow followed clearly. In our case, we have an additional challenge as we treat these patients a little better, uh, or at least we learn how to treat these patients when they're young, we need to then transition them to adult care. You know, you know, and, and that's not an easy affair either, you know, sort of thing, because we, have, we, are, uh, we are becoming a little bit more expert. Our expertise for these patients is higher and the transition is a difficult one. So we have to sort of also address this issue. And I think the ERNs can play a big role too to sort of help that transition because it's a mix of pediatric and adult hospitals. And I think each ERN should address when it's needed those issues. Uh, uh, I think that we can go to the next question because I think that we, we will have more opportunities to address complementary issues you have mentioned no? and that are quite, quite important. Uh, we have a question, several questions from Raluca Pop. Uh, about how the diseases uh, were chosen for the networks and what are the criteria used to start a network. Uh, they are the first part of the, the, her question. Uh, the, the, the diseases were chosen uh, basically uh, depending on the current classification of rare diseases that it's uh, uh, followed up and completed by, by Orphanet. And, uh, but uh, when we did the, the call for networks, each of the networks uh, projects, candidatures, were including their uh, list of diseases. In some cases, some networks are very exhaustive, are including everything. Other networks, as was mentioned by Ernst uh, Cooper, uh, were uh, less exhaustive at the beginning, and now they are expanding, like is the case of uh, rare heart diseases. Now the idea is to expand that also to cardiac uh, surgery, complex cardiac surgery uh, in children especially. Uh, and uh, it's an evolving issue, but that's the main, main, the main criteria that are uh, considered rare or complex diseases. There are many other areas like could be uh, cancer that are more and more considered a rare diseases because the, uh, the, the individualization of the subtypes of cancer, even in, in common cancer case, uh, cases. And the criteria to use as, uh, to start a network, uh, I mean, there are many criteria. There are technical criteria, organizational criteria. You will find all this information in our webpage. I do not want to take too much time on this because it's uh, a quite detailed uh, area of information. And uh, related with the changes that you expect for the new area, pandemic and post-pandemic, uh, the idea of how can a clinician register for a network, uh, there are two things. One is when the network is formally established, then uh, the, there is a call for networks, the, the, there is a candidature. But after that, uh, if you are having already a member of a network in, in, a, in a hospital, for example, in the case of the Erasmus or in the San Juan de Deu, there are clinicians that are part of the hospital that can join the multidisciplinarity. So that's open and it's a decision more related with the multidisciplinary team and with the management. I don't know if you, if you can uh, add something to this, uh, Ruben and, and Ernst, how, how is uh, 
evolving the situation at the internal level in your hospitals? Ruben. Well, I think that what you said is exactly what's, what's happening, you know. Uh, as you know, we started, you know, we need to sort of fulfill some criteria, right, in order to sort of participate. But uh, even if we don't have that criteria, we can certainly join, you know, we can sort of, you know, if I understood correctly, you can sort of become uh, affiliated, you know, to that process. And within the hospital though, care, you know, I think that once you have a participation, you can certainly link yourself to other, you know, to other staff members and to other, even other members that participate in this. I mean, I don't, I don't think if I understood correctly, that would be the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I think it's very important to recognize that it helps if the management of your hospital is supportive of the ERNs and of joining with the ERNs and where possible also to expand that participation. Uh, there is, like discussed, there is a range of different ERNs and particularly for hospitals who have larger volumes of patients with rare diseases who are a tertiary referral center uh, there is for any of them likely a chance that at least one or multiple of the ERNs are relevant for their patients and for their teams. Okay, then we can go to the next question. It's from Elena Cubano. Uh, I think that's more for, for you, Ruben and, and Ernst. What's the role, the current role and place of the hygienist in the hospital network? I understand hygienists, uh, public health uh, specialists, I don't know exactly what's the, the term involved. Yeah, I, I am not sure what a hygienist uh, in this setting would be. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe Elena can clarify for us uh, 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 exactly if it is as a public, maybe Ernst knows, I don't know, in the Spanish or English setting, I'm not exactly sure what kind of, uh, role a hygienist has in, our, in, in this setting. I think she may be no, writing I'm, something. So, we, Elena, we are a little bit uh, guessing for your question, but what is important that's in line with uh, what Enrique and Ruben already mentioned before, is that the teams, and I also alluded to it in my presentations, these teams within an individual hospital are really, really multidisciplinary. Uh, it's not just one physician or one nurse, because most of these patients with rare conditions really need a multidisciplinary team. Uh, uh, I mean, if you take particular conditions and interventions, which also have a high risk of infectious disease complications, then infectious disease experts and sometimes hygienists and others are also involved. Um, so in total within hospitals, the teams that participate that join are really multidisciplinary. If I look in my own hospital at the different people involved in the ERNs, they, it's a whole uh, different range. Okay, yes, and then if, uh, if Lena wants to complement uh, this, this question, you can do it in, in the Q&A tab. Uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, uh, we got an explanation. We will come back later to this. So we can go now to the question from Paria Bulinire Jat uh, about what's the role of network in research? How does it work? That's a huge question and a very important uh, element of the network. So I invite you, Ruben and Ernst, to, to address that. Probably will be good if you can address that from the, the importance at uh, Ernst at, at hospital level, from the managerial perspective, the importance of research and the role of the networks in that. And to Ruben, from the point of view of technicians, how that works, on uh, what's the interest of the clinician and what they are doing in relation with the network and research. Please, Ernst. Yeah, so my background is clinician and clinical researcher. Uh, um, so as you can imagine, for many studies, uh, whether it's studies which involve particular diagnostics or therapeutics or an intervention, but also studies which require certain materials, etc. A volume and number is key, is very, very important. Um, 
And that means that when patients via an ERN or via the hospital and, and their link with an ERN have access in that way to more knowledge and larger trials, you can actually progress um, much faster than when every individual centered of things alone. So um, ERNs in that way provide access to innovation um, simply because of, of numbers and knowledge and also by joining teams together and asking, for instance, for EU-related funds. Ruben. To add to, add to Ernst, uh, I think there are so many instances in the literature in the treatment of rare diseases where some decisions had to be made on the basis of studies with limited patients, that then it would turn out you know, to be conflicting results when, when you know, try to emulate in other areas. So this is a great opportunity to sort of, if not homogenize, but to diversify access to these patients so that we, this, 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 these clinical trials in particular can be done uh, in a much more thorough and, uh, and, and, and complete way. I think that this is an opportunity that I think most clinicians uh, will never give up you know, uh, and, and the opportunity to do so. Again, here, we have to be very concerned about the confidentiality issues, and there are a number of issues that have to be addressed. After all, these are patients that the, 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 the data belongs to them. But most, in most instances, these patients would be more than willing to sort of share that information so to, prove, to, uh, to proceed forward. It's a matter of getting the right regulation to be able to do so in a, in a very effective way. So uh, I th one of the areas that I think clinicians are attracted to the ERNs because it's additional work for them, as Enrique well knows, because there's a lot of work associated with, uh, with, uh, with participating, especially at the, when you're a member, ERN member. But one of the advantages there is that not only to provide care, uh, in, to, to allow access, as Ernst said, for patients that may not have access to the best care, but also to, to, give, them, to give the clinicians the opportunity to conceive uh, approach uh, research uh, questions uh, with these patients. So I, I, I think that uh, I, maybe Enrique is more aware as to some, uh, if some ERNs have already taken some action in terms of coordinating some clinical trials uh, mm -hmm. as a consequence of that. I think that this would be the natural step for these ERNs to sort of move forward. Uh, you, you, you may, I, I'm not aware of one distinctly uh, in this case, but maybe Enrique, you, you may be able to add to that. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I was disconnected for a few minutes. Oh, I, I, I didn't uh, hear no, no. I was just mentioning if there is any, uh, if there is an example of an ERN actively uh, implementing maybe a clinical trial out of their registry capacity or so. I mean, I'm sure that some of them are contemplating that, you know, they're young in their conception, but I think that potentially some of them may be already working in that direction. Uh, yes, you, you are right. Several networks are currently uh, participating in clinical trials. Now, mm -hmm. the, the participation in clinical trials is one of the most uh, discussed issue by, by, by the networks. The networks uh, are not legal entities, so they have to uh, adapt uh, their structure and their participation to the clinical trials regulations in the European Union, but it's possible and many of them are already participating with many members. Here probably the question will be, and it's also important in general for the research in the rare diseases area, where we have a lot of orphan research, orphan areas, is how the academic research in clinical trials, the so-called academic clinical trials, can be linked to the uh, commercial or pharmaceutical clinical trials in a way that we are getting a win-win situation. How to, to address uh, some drugs that will need to be developed but could be not of economic interest of all the companies, and how to balance this approach related with clinical trials and research and, uh, and the networks. So we, I hope that we will have in the next years a better uh, approach to this and a strong collaboration also with the industry that it's really very, very interested on, on this element of research and the network. So we can go to other questions. We have uh, several questions and some of them are quite complex. Uh, uh, first question is, what are the current results of the networks? 
is, for example, is there an increase in cross-border patients accessing this kind of care? Definitely, yes. We are having already uh, a lot of patients treated, treated in the, in the sense of receiving clinical advice by a multidisciplinary team uh, from different members of the network. So the, 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 the system works like this, and Ruben is... And, and Ernst can explain that in, in the real, the real life, not the systems that a, a clinician of a network is getting a patient that it's difficult to diagnose or to have a clear idea about the treatment that the, the patient will need. And uh, then this, this uh, clinician present the case to a panel, uh, to a panel of expert, selected expert of other members of the network. The, the, this clinician upload all the clinical information and the uh, different uh, uh, participants in the multidisciplinary team have a discussion and uh, they end up with a recommendation. It's exactly the same what uh, is usually done in any hospital in Europe when you are having a meeting of the clinician to discuss a case. But, a case. but here we have the capacity to do that virtually, including all the different members of the networks. There are many outcomes of the networks that, that are already there. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, some people is very impatient, impatient about the, the outcomes related with survival, quality of care, uh, curation. Of course, that's not so easy to demonstrate, as you know. In healthcare, things are not so quick. We have some intermediate outcomes created more with the process that could at the end uh, <clears throat> be uh, changes in the survival, in the relapse of diseases, etc., etc. So what I can just mention some examples. We have already uh, more than 1,000 patients discussed uh, in, in these uh, virtual panels. We have 1.5 million patients treated by the members of, of the networks. Uh, we have uh, more than uh, uh, an average of more than uh, 20 uh, research articles uh, published by each of the networks in uh, every year and many other elements related with the, with the work of the network, also in research, in the production of clinical practice guidelines, etc. Uh, I don't know if you would like to add something to this, Ruben and, and Ernst, about what your, uh, what your view on the outcome so far of the networks. At, at hospital level, what do you see from your uh, experience? Well, I, I just Ruben. obviously yeah. I I would just add that the expectation for each each ERN, you know, I'm looking at the ones that we are actively participating. Um, some are advancing at one level or another because they had you know some 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 you know they had already progressed prior to the ERNs and some some are advancing a little slower you know, the, the, you know but it is normal you know sort of thing so we are seeing that this development is 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 partial in some areas and partial in others but I think that what uh, what I do see is a clear commitment to patient care and I think that the notions that you have brought up in terms of the access to this sharing is very actively you know is active in in, in most of the ERNs here what I well, I would put a question in, in, in mind. I mean, I, I brought this up in my presentation. I, I'll, I'll, you know, cross-border care. You know, I, I know that there's a major challenge. You know, I, I brought up the issue that not all therapies are going to be available regionally, you know, for, for these patients. So I don't know if we'll be in a position or the EU or member states would be in a position to, uh, you know, to support, you know, uh, cross-border care where fit the patient physically moves, you know, in some form or fashion. This is happening under some instances, but it's, it's, it's probably out of arrangements that's made between member states. But I don't think, you know, just taking this to a, to a different level. I, want, I don't know if I should raise that issue, but I wonder where mm -hmm. things are, or where do you guys think we should be? Or should we try to, should the model be that we, we allocate uh, sufficient care locally or regionally so that these patients don't have to move? Or should we become, uh, or should the model be that the ERN should promote the uh, concentration of some care in some areas or others, especially those that require some, some form of intervention 
where you know the volume of care uh, matters in terms of the quality of that care. Enrique, can I respond to that? Yes, yes, of course, yes, please. Okay, because uh, I think that this is a very important issue which Ruben brings up. Um, and so what we are explaining is that ERNs basically are a recent, a recent invention. We, the ERNs haven't been around yet for 20 years, only for a short period. And in this short period with 24, they have already come a long way, but a lot of further progress to be made uh, and many ideas are there. And I think that if they really evolve, if we as clinicians and as hospital managers can bring this further, then yes, for sure, at some point, it will definitely for certain interventions and for certain conditions need to also mean that for the particular intervention, patients may have to go to one particular place in Europe. Um, I mean, if there are rare interventions and for sometimes now for these conditions, we already consider that the center, which does, for instance, one particular intervention five times a year, even when it's crucial for, let's say, in congenital conditions, it's crucial lifelong, then why not travel from the Netherlands to Spain to undergo that one intervention? And then fire the ERN and with all the modern tools that we have, do the further follow-up. That's also what we see in our countries already, that for particular interventions, you see further and further concentration for good reasons. So why not benefit from the total population that we have here in Europe? And that also taps into the next question, Enrique, about whether it also help, could help for physician career development and fellowship yeah. centers. Yeah, I think the two would actually come together very well. Yes, indeed. And, and, and actually, it's, uh, the, the, the idea of concentration of care and and distributing somehow the, the, the best capacity among the, the, the centers in Europe is something completely irrational. Is what in a, in a, in a member state, it's, it's healthcare is organized like this, no? And outcomes are yeah. different, of course. Outcomes are completely different. In, in some cases, it has been demonstrated since many years ago. If you are treating less than 40 cases of pediatric cancer in a center, you are having uh, worse resource. That's clear. So the, uh, it's something that the, the, the healthcare should be organized, taking into account these differences and also uh, being able to use the complementarity of the of the member states and of the centers. No, but also, of course, it's also a political decision that has to be taken by by, by the national authorities. Because I think with the experience of the networks, I, and, and you are privileged actors there, and, and Ruben, it's coming clearer that we will need a more efficient and, and, and easier way to uh, provide cross-border healthcare. Yeah. I think it responds, I, uh, yeah, if I may say so, Hearns, you, you brought up in your presentation how uh, society wants to wants to have something close, nearby, feel local. And on the other hand, we know as clinicians, what you just said, Enrique, that for some things you need to go to the place, you know, that they, they do it better, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, either because it's volume yeah. or so. And I think an, a, a system like the ERNs provides a solution for that. Because if the two centers, you know, if your local center is linked to that center, you know, in, in some ways, going to that place because you know especially if there is you know there is the political will and the financial will you know to sort of support that uh, but you come back home you come back home and you 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 still you still you still attend the day i think that that is a step for this model to sort of progress to i think you know that that, that it makes complete sense to me and and yeah and, and since the ERNs, I mean, you know are doing that you know you know mm -hmm. and uh, what i um, i'd like to stress that for many of these conditions, the actual timing of a specific intervention for which you may have to go to a central facility usually is only a very, very small part of the total pathway across many, many years. 
So why, if that is a crucial intervention, why not do that at a centralized facility, even if it means traveling from the Netherlands to Spain or the other way around? That's, I mean, I think that that's a, a key issue that probably for the decision makers at political level, we will need to demonstrate after the first five years of working of the networks, the value of the networks, we will need to, to show the data, we will need to show the experience, and that should be the next question. So why we are not yeah. evolving and changing our, our view on, on doing things, no? Uh, we are having just yeah. five minutes more, so I will propose you to go quick through the, some of the questions we are having here. I think Enrique got frozen. Yeah, so we can deal with the questions, we can, I guess. We can, uh, uh, Ernst, go for it. <laughs> yeah. So one question is uh, the physician career development we already briefly mentioned. Uh, Ruben, yeah. do you want to add anything to that? No, I think the I think I think the, it's clear that the opportunities are there for these ERNs to yeah. sort of provide support for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think we all see already major uh, uh, exchange. Yeah? For instance, in pediatric surgery for rare conditions, that's just mm -hmm. one example. Sorry, Erika, we were dealing with the questions because you were out of reach. <laughs> yes, <laughs> take over from us again. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Uh, well, perhaps you can say something about the summer school being about COVID-19 and the role of the network with COVID-19 management. Okay, here what I will say is that actually it was uh, amazing the, 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 the capacity of the networks to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. All the yeah. 24 networks, they have been working on that they have been providing information, they have been providing and they have been analyzing the impact both of the COVID-19 pandemic in their patient and also how uh, the, the patient with uh, a rare condition and being infected by COVID-19 should be treated. And that has been an excellent example on how the networking model was able to work in an area that was completely new for everyone. So I would say from my personal experience and from my colleagues, we organized, we have organized uh, 14 webinars by, the, by 14 networks addressing specifically, for example, we have uh, uh, two, two <clears throat> webinars on rare cardiac diseases and COVID-19. And we were addressing specifically the different elements, the experience, and that was not possible uh, for other uh, clinical areas not involved in a network. So what our experience is that having a network there facilitate in a so important way the capacity of the clinicians to work together or even to, to ask questions, normal question. What are you doing with this type of patient? For that, you need a structure. You need to have already the means, the capacity of connection. You cannot improvise that. And, and that has been one of the most important lessons of the, of the networks. And that's the reason that we are now, uh, we already may, uh, have proposed that to the member states to start to work on a, a specific network on rare and threatening infectious diseases. So we have uh, reached uh, the, 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 the time we were having for the webinar. I think that we are having many, many other questions there uh, that uh, the, 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 the expertise and experience of Ernst and Ruben is uh, great for that. And probably we will need a couple of hours more <laughs> for addressing all the questions and all the debate. So I would like again to thank you, both of you, and invite you if you have a final, a final message to the audience, please go ahead. No, thank you very much uh, for doing this and uh, clear from all the questions that uh, we need to do it again on short notes, on, in a short time. Uh, thank you, same thing. Uh, I think that uh, 
it, it, it is a good ex, it is a good experiment for future for future reference in, in other in other areas of work. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, and 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 Ruben. Just to mention that uh, tomorrow we will have uh, uh, in the frame of the summer school. Uh, we will have uh, the next webinar, uh, which is, sorry, one moment, because my screen went out. Okay, I cannot reach that. But tomorrow you will, you will have a, a, a new webinar uh, on, in the program at four. Please go to the webpage of the summer school. You will have there all the information. And uh, thank you very much again to everyone for participating uh, in this uh, event. Have a nice evening and stay safe. Bye bye.